thank you very much indeed. And could I therefore uh, kick off, please, and thank you for finally releasing the list of ministerial responsibilities um, after much prompting from this committee and others. Um, it's noticeable within the Cabinet Office that many of your junior ministers, quotes, support you in various policy areas. So is uh, ministerial accountability clear within the Cabinet Office? Yes. And in their support, could you describe the nature of it? Yes. Uh, obviously, it depends on uh, the different areas which I discharge. But in, in short order, um, the um, Minister for uh, the Constitution and Devolution um, supports me in making sure not just that um, the uh, intergovernmental relations that uh, the Cabinet Office oversees, meetings of the Joint Committee on European Negotiations and so on, run smoothly, but she is also heavily involved in policy work, uh, whether that relates to specific constitutional issues like the uh, reform of the Fixed-Term Parliament Act um, or uh, how we can make sure that uh, the UK internal market uh, works best. One of the reasons for a delay in finalising all of the responsibilities was that uh, Julia Lopez, um, another one of the very talented junior ministers in the department, was in Australia um, because of the uh, at the time that the COVID pandemic broke. It was only when Julia came back that uh, we were able to finalise all of them. It's also the case that sometimes responsibilities shift within the department. We have a joint minister, for example, with the HM Treasury, Lord Agnew. He has recently acquired additional responsibility for some HMRC-related issues um, in connection with the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Okay. And moving on with that theme, is it clear where accountability lies between the civil service and ministers? Yes, it, the buck stops with ministers. And so what are permanent secretaries accountable for as opposed to ministers? Well, permanent secretaries, of course, like all civil servants, um, work to ensure that the uh, government of the day's priorities are implemented. But ultimately, of course, um, uh, it is the case that we are accountable as ministers uh, to Parliament and we bear direct accountability for the actions of our departments. And so where does responsibility lie when policy goes wrong, with the minister or the civil servant? Um, sometimes it can be um, many ministers uh, where the responsibility lies. The judgment as to when policy goes wrong, of course, is um, uh, uh, rarely a definitive one which gets 100% consensus. No, but, but broadly speaking, it, it, it tends to be reasonably obvious, though, doesn't it? Yeah. And so how can we tell whether uh, the civil service or the government that's uh, responsible for that broad consensus of things not going quite to plan? Well, I think that there's uh, generally a wealth of evidence, and select committees are often expert at um, both unearthing and analysing it, uh, to uh, draw conclusions about why things have gone wrong in particular areas. Um, uh, and, of course, that judgment is one which is uh, uh, never a science, but relies, of course, on the assessment of evidence and then the exercise of judgment. And so you appreciate the difference between responsibility and accountability? Yes. I and mean, again, um, ministers are accountable to uh, Parliament, um, and they're responsible for what goes on um, in their departments, uh, uh, and they take responsibility for that. No minister, given uh, the way in which modern government works, will be aware of uh, every submission circulating within that department, every decision that might be made, uh, every administrative process that might go on. Uh, for example, my colleague, um, who's the Secretary of State at the Department of Work and Pensions, uh, is responsible for one of the largest civil service workforces, pr providing one of the most important services. Um, but if a single universal credit uh, um, mistake is made, uh, that is deeply regrettable for the individual involved, um, but uh, I don't think anyone would say that that was, well, ultimately the person who's accountable for it, and you'd want to investigate why, uh, if it were part of a broader systemic failure, that systemic failure had been uh, allowed to continue, would be the Secretary of State. No one, I think, would say that uh, that individual uh, 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 bug in the system um, was uh, her or his fault. No, but that's a very specific example. What about broad policy? I mean, take purely at random a department that, such as the Department of Education uh, that presumably um, knew that examinations weren't taking place and that therefore there might be some issue mm. uh, with an important aspect of its work. Mm. Uh, and then very senior officials ever in the uh, department or indeed uh, an, an agency uh, mm. determined that they should fall on their swords 
is it, is it not peculiar that a minister might not do the same? Well, uh, uh, I've been Secretary of State for Education um, in the past, and I appreciate how complex many of these questions are. Um, I know that the uh, Education Select Committee has taken evidence, I think from Ofqual and others, um, about this question. Um, uh, uh, I would say that uh, the, uh, the challenges that were faced by governments across the United Kingdom um, as a result of uh, the COVID pandemic were unprecedented, um, and there was a broad consensus that in the circumstances where it would be difficult to press ahead with examinations, that an alternative method of assessment had to be found. But because it was unprecedented, inevitably it was a, a challenging delivery environment. And so you agree that re responsibility can be shared, but that accountability rests solely with the minister concerned? Ultimate accountability rests with the minister, yes. And so, but much like uh, Harry Truman, it would be helpful if ministers had that uh, motto on their desk of the book stopping with them. I think um, most ministers are, are conscious. I remember Jack Straw saying that when he was Home Secretary, uh, he was very conscious of the fact that um, at any given moment uh, there were things happening in uh, his department um, which could lead to uh, unfortunate political consequences for him. It's, it's part of political life. But my other view also is that um, wherever possible, and it's a point that I made in, in the context of uh, the civil service, well, we should um, ensure that uh, experience, authority, uh, uh, you know, deep subject expertise is prized, and so we would want to keep people, particularly people who are passionate about delivering in a particular area, mm -hmm. um, uh, in post or in that area or in that region uh, for as long as possible. And so in order to clarify where that um, heavy responsibility lies, should the civil service be more willing to ask for formal ministerial directions, or do you think it's more likely that they will? in light of recent events? I don't think it's more likely, but I think um, uh, sometimes it's appropriate, and I've issued them myself in the past. Thank you. Karen Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr Goh, we, we corresponded as a committee with you over the summer about the internal market mm. bill, um, and we now have um, what I think we can all agree is a, an extraordinarily quick parliamentary timetable to pursue the bill. We are also expecting um, the government's Constitution, Democracy and Rights Commission uh, to report. So can, can you talk us through the government's view about how the speed of this bill, in light of other constitutional bills we're expecting, really respects the various parts of the United Kingdom and, and will enhance our democracy and rights for people across the United Kingdom? Yes, I think the, the, the important thing to stress about the UK internal market uh, bill is that it's primarily an economic measure. Um, and that's why it's the business department that is, is leading on it. Um, and the UK Internal Market Bill is there to ensure that as we leave the European Union, um, um, you know, for the last 40 years, many of the rules that have governed uh, the circulation of goods within the UK have been EU single market goods, uh, uh, sing EU single market rules, forgive me, um, that we have a, a, a robust legal framework uh, to underpin that. Um, you mentioned the Constitution um, uh, Commission. It, it is the case that uh, uh, inevitably there are constitutional matters which we'll need to address in this Parliament, including the repeal of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act um, and so on. Um, but in the meantime, one of the reasons for making sure that we can proceed with the UK Internal Market Bill is that um, uh, businesses have told us that they would prefer to have uh, certainty uh, at the end of the transition period on how the UK internal market will operate. Thank you. David Jones, please. Uh, sorry, uh, David Mundell. Can I just, uh, Mr Gove, as you're with us, ask something specific on the internal market yes. bill? Because mm. uh, one of the dangers of proceeding at pace is that misinformation yes. uh, abounds. Uh, and one piece of misinformation I'm concerned about is the suggestion mm. that the internal markets bill could impact on the Barnett formula, and I wonder if you're in a position just to categorically rule that out. Um, yes, I can. Um, uh, there's nothing in the UK internal market that will or is intended to in any way uh, bear on or have an impact on the Barnett formula. The Barnett formula is a tried and trusted way of making sure that the unique uh, needs of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland within our United Kingdom are protected when it comes to the allocation of expenditure. Of course, there is some expenditure out with the Barnett formula. For example, it is the case um, we touched on DWP earlier, that DWP administer universal credit across the whole country. But the Barnett formula is not imperiled in any way by this bill. Obviously, uh, in, uh, in the Chamber next week, there will be uh, an opportunity to debate the impact of the bill on uh, the devolution settlements. But can you set out for us what the government's vision, overall vision, for devolution within the United Kingdom is, or indeed is the one within government? 
Yes, there is. Um, uh, our overall vision is that we believe that uh, devolution provides the best of both worlds, um, and that in all of those parts of the United Kingdom in which there are devolved administrations, both governments should work together for the good of our citizens. So uh, uh, your constituents um, ha have the Scottish Government responsible, obviously, for uh, the delivery of uh, education. It's responsible for the administration of uh, our UK National Health Service in Scotland. Um, and it's responsible for a plethora of other um, uh, important matters, all of which were uh, uh, clearly devolved in the um, original devolution legislation. And indeed, uh, more powers have been given to Holyrood since then, not least in the Scotland Act, which you had such an important role in bringing to the House of Commons and through the House of Commons. At the same time, we also believe that every part of the United Kingdom benefits from the broad shoulders of the UK Treasury, from the, uh, the strength of the common ties that bind us. Um, and so the important way, I think, uh, to proceed is to make sure that um, both governments work in, uh, in the interest of all. Um, and I think that's the position of uh, other unionist parties, like uh, uh, the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats. Each of us might have our own ideas ab about um, uh, individual aspects of the Constitution, but all of us recognise that strength. Of course, our colleagues from the Scottish National Party and Plaid Cymru uh, would prefer just to have uh, one government working on its own uh, for, for uh, the individual parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, I don't believe that's right, but of course I respect the argument. In terms of uh, the the relationship with the, of the UK government with uh, the devolved uh, administrations and, and parliaments. A report was commissioned yes. from uh, Lord Dunlop into mm. how the, that, that mm. relationship could be improved and, and mm. uh, that the UK government could uh, act more effectively in relation to its uh, responsibilities and relationships. And uh, when the Minister for Co the Constitution, for whom I have a lot of respect, mm. Uh, was uh, before this committee. I mean, her answers in our simple question mm. of whether that report was going to be published were frankly unsatisfactory. And I wonder perhaps uh, uh, if you could clarify whether the Dunlop report will be published. Yes, it will. It's an excellent report. It makes a series of practical recommendations. Many of those recommendations um, are in the process of being implemented. The approach that uh, I wanted to take in any uh, deficiency in answering the questions will have been as a result of what I was doing rather than anything that the minister. So the was buck doing. was stopping with you. The buck was stopping with me. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and I, m my approach was that I wanted to make sure that when we publish the Dunlop report, um, we can say not uh, this is a plan of action which we're punting into the future, but these are a series of recommendations, and you can see that we have uh, responded to all of them. Some of the recommendations in the report we're implementing in a slightly different way from the way in which Lord Dunlop. Uh, argued for, but overall it is an excellent report. So, I want to thank him for it, and we will publish it. So, so, so when? Uh, uh, later this year. Later this year. No greater specificity than that? Um, no. Uh, again, one of the things that I want to do is to make sure, without prejudice to the views of the devolved administrations, that we can conclude a review of intergovernmental relations. I'm very keen that we should do that. Uh, the Minister for Constitution and Devolution is working on that. Uh, when that cake is baked, if it is, then the report can be published. That depends on progress with the uh, devolved administrations. Um, and to be fair to all the devolved administrations, they've been very, very keen to make progress on it, though there are still one or two bits of, 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 of contention. Thank you. Uh, you'll pub sorry, Chairman, just to try sure. you You'll publish the report in full and see oh, yes. what, oh, no, what no, you no, have no, done in respect. Exactly. What we want to do is to publish the report, mm -hmm. to thank Lord Dunlop, and to explain what we've done in order to implement it, and, and where we disagree about aspects of implementation, to explain, not because we think his reasoning is wrong, but just because some circumstances yeah. have moved on. Okay. Uh, Ronnie Caron, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Just to, to tidy something that you said earlier on, Mr Gove, you said that the devolved powers were defined in the Scotland Act. The devolved powers are not defined in the Scotland Act. The reserved powers are defined, and if it's not reserved, then it is devolved by default. So coming to the internal mar UK Internal Market Bill, this bill, and you also said it does not affect Barnet, but this bill allows the UK government to impose their projects on the people of Scotland, and therefore that could affect funding set aside for schools and hospitals. So the funding can be affected, determined by how you use this bill. This bill is so open in many things that it can do, that it can undermine food standards in Scotland, agriculture in Scotland, and building projects in Scotland. It also undermines the laws in Scotland. 
I cannot see how you can possibly justify this as being a good thing for a healthy, devolved parliament. A number of very important points you raised, Ronnie. Um, the first thing is um, the UK government imposing things on, on Scotland. Well, it, it depends on how you use that verb. I mean, the UK government, you can argue, has imposed the furlough scheme in Scotland, has imposed eat out to help out in Scotland, um, uh, has imposed the Barnet formula on Scotland. Uh, it is the case that uh, the broad shoulders of the uh, UK government and the Treasury have meant that public spending in Scotland, both through the Barnet formula and through these other measures, has been higher than in other parts of the United Kingdom. Quite right, too. I would always defend it, and I sometimes have to defend it to colleagues from other parts of the United Kingdom. So it's not a matter of imposition. It's a matter of sharing and working together um, and <coughs> respecting the devolution settlement. Um, and the whole point about the devolution settlement is that there is a role for both governments working together. Um, and that's what that bill brings um, uh, 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 even more firmly into focus. Um, you made a point about um, uh, apparent dangers on food standards, agriculture, and so on. Uh, not at all. Uh, stuff and nonsense. Um, I mean, the case is that when you think about agriculture in Scotland, um, which uh, is a critically important part of Scotland's economy, um, uh, the uh, administration of agriculture in Scotland, the disbursement of uh, support to farmers, uh, environmental regulations, these are all devolved matters and, and a good thing too. And in fact, it is the case that as a result of our departure from the European Union, uh, the Scottish Government has additional powers to control what happens in agriculture, um, which it didn't have before. You, 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 you talk about mutual recognition of standards. So if it's mutual recognition, that can be imposed on the UK government. No, I think that's a misunderstanding on your part. Let me, let me complete the point. Um, uh, it is the case that um, uh, 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 your colleague and, and my friend Fergus Ewing has brought forward legislation in the Scottish Parliament to uh, simplify the common agricultural policy and to alter it in circumstances which are uniquely in Scotland's interests. He would not have been able to bring forward the legislation in the way that he has if Scotland were still in the EU. Now, my understanding of the Scottish Government's position is that it would like Scotland to leave the United Kingdom and to re-enter the EU. If it were the case that Scotland did that, then the additional freedoms that the Scottish Parliament um, and the Scottish Government will enjoy after the December the 31st would no longer exist. It would be an odd thing. It would be an odd thing. No, 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 no. Let, let, me, let me finish, Ronnie, and then, and then I'm sure you can come back. It would be an odd thing, um, as again, the former Scottish Government Minister Alec Neil has pointed out, um, and indeed other, uh, the, the former deputy leader of the SNP, Jim Sillers, has pointed out, for a movement which wants greater independence to separate from the United Kingdom and then to make itself within the EU more dependent on a body over which it exercised uh, um, less influence um, well, and, and, um, and, and, as a, and, and in the process of the British power. That's not what we're, talk, we're talking about here today. You're going to a completely different channel here. That's not what we're talking about here. I think you have to really reread Clause 46 if you honestly believe that you're not imposing upon the opportunities for the Scottish Government to impose its own powers and its own food standards and its own building projects. Reread Clause 46. This is not just a Scottish National Party. The Labour Welsh Government has also made clear it vehemently opposes this process. Well, I'm sure that we will find that uh, there'll be lots of Labour voices uh, discussing how we can make the United Kingdom stronger. That's the shared commitment of um, everyone I know within the Labour Party. Um, but, you know, we, we, we take a different position. You know, Conservatives, this Government, want to make devolution work. Um, the, uh, the Scottish National Party, a perfectly legitimate position, doesn't believe in devolution. It doesn't want devolution to work. It wants devolution to fail um, because it wants independence, separation, then rejoining the European Union and the surrender of, of additional powers and um, uh, autonomy that Scotland and the whole of the United Kingdom would enjoy. Well, that would be a matter for the people of Scotland. Well, of course people will vote um, in the future on these questions, but uh, uh, the key thing I would say is that uh, the Scottish National Party position, as I pointed out, very distinguished nationalist figures like Jim Sillers and Alec Neil and others have pointed out the logical inconsistency in it, um, is to uh, uh, separate from the United Kingdom in order to be more dependent on another political entity. Thank you, Ronnie. Just uh, in terms of housekeeping, obviously down the line it's difficult and speaking oh. over one another is never edifying, so if you could bear that in mind. I'm trying to keep my answers shorter. Very kind. Um, Karen Smith, please. Yes, if I can just come back. Um, so, I, so I think what we've heard is that the government you know, has this excellent report. We, we take your word for how excellent it is because 
obviously none of you seen it. Um, in fact, you are implementing the report, but you're not publishing it, but you are progressing with the Internal Market Bill, which I think everyone would recognise and we're starting to hear is hugely controversial and at least desettling for, this, the, the, for the devolved uh, regions. Uh, you know, how, 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 how can you be doing those things simultaneously? Why don't you just publish Dun Dunlop now in advance of the, the bill? Well, um, the report bears on um, a range of areas where we can make the union work better, but the UK Internal Market Bill is primarily an economic measure that is required um, as a result of our departure from the European Union, which provides us with um, significant additional opportunities as well. Um, but I think it's fair to say that um, unless something unprecedented happens, that the Dunlop uh, report will be published before the UK Internal Market Bill uh, uh, reaches the statute book. Uh, the other point that I would make is that um, with the UK Internal Market Bill, there is a, a broad consensus, certainly among unionist parties, um, that uh, the UK Internal Market is worth preserving um, and enhancing. Uh, are there are technical questions about how one does so, and I'm looking forward to uh, the debates about those in which um, Alok uh, Sharma and, and Bay's colleagues will engage. But there's a difference between uh, that approach and uh, the approach of, of Ronnie's party. They don't believe in a, a, a UK Internal Market Bill. But, but, but with respect, mm an economic bill with huge constitutional issues, which is the subject of our correspondence over the summer, which is why you have Minister Smith also... Oh, yes, no, no, I think it. that's right. So, so, to, so I'm afraid no, that's to fair. pretend that it is simply an economic bill. No, 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 it's, it's primarily an economic measure, um, and it becomes even more important economically as we think about um, how we recover from COVID, because reducing costs for um, uh, companies and uh, for... Uh, workers in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is part of the recovery programme um, overall. Um, but you are right, of course, um, there are always constitutional questions in, when you're dealing with um, uh, these matters. And just finally, Chair, if I may, do you have, what concerns do you have about the desettlement of the very fragile situation in Northern Ireland with some of the uh, parts of this bill? Um, my view is, but again, you know, I, I know that there are many uh, different views, that what the bill does is that it makes sure that um, uh, Northern Ireland citizens and businesses have unfettered access to the rest of the United Kingdom. And that was one of the things that was guaranteed in the protocol, which is part of the withdrawal agreement, and the bill gives effect to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lloyd Russell-Moyle, please. Um, Secretary, go th 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 thank, you very, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, I you mentioned about making devolution work, and I very much agree with uh, that. Um, and uh, as we all know, we constantly obsess about devolution in Wales, Northern Ireland, and um, Scotland, but its poorest sister um, in the question is actually what we do with England. Is England actually how we deal with England more important in making devolution work because whilst we have a British Parliament that also is an English Parliament, the Scot Nats and the Welsh Nats will constantly have a legitimate grievance that it is being done to them because there is not a clear delineation of power. Um, and so how are you involved in some of those discussions around English devolution? Um, and where would you see the direction of that travel going beyond just mayors? Yes, well, I think, I, I, I think, Lord, you raise a really very important question in which there are a range of, um, uh, uh, I think, influential and important currents of opinion. Um, uh, I, I think the first thing to say is that uh, the lead department, when it thinks about, uh, in thinking about uh, devolution in England, is MHCLG. Um, a white paper is going to be published a wee bit later uh, by Robert Jenrick, um, and it will look at some of these questions. It will look at uh, the extension of uh, uh, mayors, as you point out. It will also look at um, uh, the way in which um, uh, we can uh, perhaps revisit some aspects of the local government settlement, um, and it will also build on some of the successful devolution of powers that Metro mayors and others have enjoyed. Um, my own view is that I wouldn't want myself to dictate where uh, this conversation should end, because I think it's important um, that we take account of the views of people um, in different parts of England. Um, you know, there is an issue, you're absolutely right, when you have uh, 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 the constituent parts of the United Kingdom and England forming 85% of the population, but I think that the important thing for us to do is to have a, a, a mature debate about how we can resolve that. Um, I'm not myself 
uh, a fan of what some people would call federalism. Um, but I think the important thing to do is to have that respectful conversation because constitutions evolve over time to take account of new challenges. If, and I, I take that you're not um, necessarily a supporter of federalism yourself, um, but if we, as you quite rightly pointed out, have England that has the bulk of the economic and population, um, and we constantly treat England as one homogenous block, even if we break down the power within England, versus another set of smaller blocks, constantly that imbalance of power is going to be where um, the grit in our union is. And is there not some sense in breaking down England so we don't talk about England as what England is one homogenous block, but instead talk about the different cultural, political uh, currents? And so therefore, is that not a question that's not just local government, but a question that should sit in your department, which is about the, the border, how England fits in the Constitution. Yes, I think it's a perfectly legitimate conversation. Absolutely, not, not just legitimate, important um, and vital, in which there are different views. My own view is that actually a sense of um, understandable um, uh, pride um, uh, in England and its history uh, is a good thing. Um, uh, but I also recognise that there are, um, uh, within England, um, there are uh, local and regional identities, um, uh, yeah, and yes, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and we should just look at how uh, local government and governance overall reflects that. Um, so yes, MHCLG is the lead department. Um, uh, Rob Jenrick has been given um, uh, a lot of thought to this. Uh, the excellent Simon Clark, who uh, stood down as minister two days ago, did an enormous amount of work on this, and I just want to pay tribute to him. Um, and, and again, whether in a select committee or elsewhere, I, th I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to talk about. You know, I, I should say that some of the most interesting thinking about this has been done by people within the Labour tradition. So people like John Denham have been thinking about uh, the position of England within the United Kingdom. And while I don't agree with everything he says, I think that he's opened up um, and led a, a very uh, fruitful avenue of debate. But from your department, and this is just, just to clarify, from your department, you don't necessarily think that relationship with England and Scotland and England and Wales and England and Northern Ireland should necessarily change. You're just talking here about the relationship of how power is yes. um, split well, up in England. Well, I'm always willing to, uh, to look at ways in which we can make the United Kingdom overall stronger. So I, I have uh, uh, preferences and judgments based on experience, um, but it, it's always the case, uh, as, as the experience which I alluded to that David Mundell had um, uh, shows, that uh, if a, a case can be made for uh, additional steps that can be taken which strengthen uh, the United Kingdom and uh, adjust the devolution settlement in the right way, great. But the really important thing, I think, is we recognise the success of devolution in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Don't do anything to undermine that, but work with the governments there in order to make it work. But the broader questions you raise are legitimate questions uh, for, for uh, medium to long-term debate. And then finally, i just put this out there. Is there any discussions with your colleagues at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office about how our overseas territories fit into that constitutional arrangement going forward. I mean, Gibraltar clearly is mm. now out of the European Union, will mm. need to be part of a new constitutional settlement in terms of the market mm. uh, as well for them. So uh, is your department leading on that or is that again just something that is hived off to the Foreign Office uh, and not part of that bigger constitutional settlement question? Uh, it is part of a broader question. Um, narrowly, um, the, um, and I know you asked about the overseas territories, but the Crown dependencies are the responsibility of the Ministry of Justice but I take a very close interest in the Crown dependencies um, and our relationship with them and our wider relationship with the world. But if you include the whole British family, including the overseas territories, I do take a close interest in that, the FCDO lead on that. But we do have discussions, and I've had discussions with Foreign Secretaries past and present, um, about um, uh, the Falklands, Gibraltar, um, and other OTs as well. Good. Thank you. Thank you. A very quick supplementary question from Ronnie Cowan, please. Yeah, just very briefly, Mr. Gove, you've said this a number of times that devolution's a great success. I'm just wondering if it's such a great success for those of people who live in Scotland, why did the latest poll show 56% of people voting for independence? Well, I think that uh, uh, we've seen over the course of the 
uh, last 10 to 12 years um, a significant, you know, notwithstanding the recent challenges that the COVID pandemic has shown, um, a significant improvement in uh, productivity in Scotland, in the economic performance of Scotland. What is striking, and I'm quoting, of course, from um, the response that the Scottish Government gave to our UK internal market white paper, is how since 2008, um, uh, you know, 12 years uh, ago, most of those 12 years, of course, you've had either a Conservative or a coalition government, uh, Scotland's economy has improved. When I visit Scotland, uh, to see my mum and dad, or to uh, be with friends, or to uh, 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 discharge my responsibilities. I'm struck by how rich Scotland's cultural life is, um, by how uh, robust and attractive its institutions are, by how, notwithstanding everything that we've seen um, over the last few months, um, there is a, a spirit of enterprise and optimism. Um, I'm also struck by the fact that um, uh, most folk think that uh, actually a really important thing for politicians at the moment to do is to concentrate on uh, working together to get through the COVID crisis, to improve our economy, uh, to improve schools and hospitals, um, and constitutional matters, while they matter to you and me, are, are never very high on their list of priorities. Thank you. David Jones, please. Yes, just briefly, may I say from a Welsh perspective how very pleased I am that the government is introducing the UK Internal Market Bill, which will be hugely appreciated by Welsh businesses. Thank you, uh, David. And uh, it's certainly the case that there have been a number of Welsh businesses that have been in touch with us to say that they are uh, uh, glad that this legislation is putting everything on a firmer footing. Um, the, the Cabinet Office uh, web page describes the role of the office as supporting the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, of course, has got his own establishment uh, in number 10. Um, could you explain how the Cabinet Office works with the number 10 establishment? Yes. Um, essentially, the cam <coughs> it's, it's, it's like a, a sort of gearing mechanism within the machinery of government. Um, so uh, the Cabinet Office is a, uh, uh, an additional cog and that makes sure that government machinery overall does what the Prime Minister wants. In narrow accounting terms, number 10, the Prime Minister's private office, uh, his policy unit and so on, fall within uh, the Cabinet Office overall in terms of spending. But I don't think anyone would suggest that um, even though it's the Cabinet Office uh, spending uh, 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 settlement overall that pays for it, um, that we're anything other than servants of uh, the Prime Minister. So the Cabinet Office is there to make sure that the Prime Minister's uh, priorities and the government's uh, manifesto are implemented. It has particular responsibilities um, when it comes to uh, the efficiency of the operation of government, the resilience of our constitution, and also at the moment, uh, preparation for the end of the transition period. And therefore, I imagine there's a very close interface between the staff of the Cabinet Office and the staff of Number 10. Absolutely. Um, and so the new uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, was a, a Cabinet Office official who then went to work for the Prime Minister in <coughs> Number 10 and who, of course, is now Cabinet Secretary. Uh, famously, uh, you move from the Cabinet Office to Number 10 by going through a, a single link door. The, the, the two physical departments are linked in that way. Um, and it is often the case that officials from uh, the Prime Minister's private office or the policy unit will be meeting with officials in the Cabinet Office and also the Treasury to uh, cooperate on the government's priorities. We've heard a lot about the new collaboration hub uh, within the Cabinet Office. Could you describe its work, please? Yes, um, I, I, it's, it's attracted a lot of outside attention, um, and I wouldn't want to uh, exaggerate its significance, nor would I want to minimise it. Um, in, in essence, uh, it is a way of co-locating uh, some of those who work in the uh, uh, Cabinet Office Secretariat um, and who are responsible for preparing the papers for uh, uh, cabinet committees and for government de decision with individuals from the, uh, the Prime Minister's policy unit um, in order to make sure that uh, uh, the policies which are at the heart of the government and the material that's generated for ministers to make decisions um, uh, can be shared in the same room. But it is um, another manifestation of something that's happened uh, throughout the years, and I think across administrations, where the centre works together in order to make sure the Prime Minister's uh, priorities are delivered. And is it a, a cabinet office body or is it a number 10 one? Um, uh, it's cabinet office and it will have cabinet office and number 10 staff working in it. Uh, and is it staffed by political appointees or, or by permanent civil service or a mixture of both? A mixture, because uh, the Prime Minister's policy unit 
has traditionally had a mixture of uh, secondees from elsewhere in the civil service um, and people from outside who um, are appointed, some of whom will have a political background, uh, some of whom don't. Uh, you know, they, they'll, they'll be hired because of their, I mean, obviously they'll have political views, but they'll be hired because of their uh, expertise and authority in particular disciplines. Uh, and what is the, the the chain of command, so to speak, within there? Is, is, is it headed by um, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff? Well, I imagine that, it, it, because we're still in the process of resolving all of these questions, um, that people will be ultimately uh, uh, answerable in that office to, uh, ultimately answerable to the Cabinet Secretary, um, but whether or not it is the case that the Permanent Secretary at number 10, if a new one is appointed, which I imagine they will be, or the Cabinet Office Permanent Secretary would be the person who would be um, IC there. So that remains to be determined? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And building on that metaphor, is that famous door ever locked at the moment? Uh, I've never seen it locked. Um, uh, you need a pass to get through. Um, um, and uh, there are some people who, whose faces are sufficiently familiar over time, not necessarily to need that pass. So, you know, when... Um, uh, it would suggest a, a very close relationship between the Cabinet Office and Number 10. Yes. Thank you. Jackie Doyle-Price, please. Sorry. Um, I'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions about uh, communications uh, and uh, how the government uh, is going to be running that going forward. I mean, do you, why do you think that greater centralisation of government communications in the Cabinet Office is necessary? Well, one of the things that uh, Francis Maud, as uh, Cabinet Office Minister, did um, when he was my predecessor is to bring together certain cross-government functions. So whether it's management of the government's property estate or the management of the government's digital service um, or the uh, provision of legal advice across government, rather than uh, each uh, department uh, going its own way, there were economies of scale um, and there was a greater level of coordination um, if all of them came together. So GCS, the Government Communication Service, preceded um, uh, this Prime Minister or my own arrival in office. Um, communications overall uh, changes and evolves over time. You need to make sure that you keep pace with modern platforms and uh, uh, modern media. Uh, but what is being contemplated is simply the, uh, the next uh, refinement of a process that had already been in place in the past. Okay, so how does that work then in terms of messaging? Because obviously... Um, the government will have its overall narrative. I mean, if we take, for example, um, the uh, coronavirus response, mm. uh, clearly that's a, that's a cross-government uh, uh, yeah. issue. And there is obviously good reasons to uh, yeah. centralise communications, not least to get consistency of message when you've got many departments uh, involved. But equally, um, there will be... Uh, other areas of policy which which are much more niche uh, mm. where the audience is perhaps not the general public but perhaps you know individual professions for example totally. so how do we get the balance right how do, how do you see that playing out in the future in terms of what would be managed centrally and what individual departments would do particularly in terms of setting that message well i think that's a very important point um, I'm, and, and i think that um we can describe uh, potential situations, but we won't know everyone um, in advance. But as a general rule, I think you're right. You know, if you've got something um, like a pandemic, well, uh, uh, DHSC will be in the lead. Um, it, it, other government departments will have to uh, coordinate their message as appropriate with it. Um, but also, to take DHSC as an example, uh, it will have a relationship with specialist titles, um, and it will have a relationship with its own staff, um, and indeed the uh, employees in the NHS, which will require communications professionals uh, whose job uh, is uh, uh, very much to make sure that those uh, specific specialist channels are properly uh, uh, communicated through. Um, so again, it's, it's not quite, you know it when you see it, but I think it's, it's a process of, like in any organization, working out what is it that we should do effectively centrally, what is it that we should um, uh, uh, leave devolved, how do we ensure that there's an appropriate process of reviewing uh, when that balance may need to change? So I guess what's sitting, sitting about a, a general area of concern that, pe that people have expressed is that there is a risk that 
uh, messages be could become overtly politicised uh, through centralisation. But from what you've just said, uh, the centralisation appears to be more about operational nuts and bolts rather than messaging. Yes. Is that correct? Absolutely. I think it's important that um, uh, the government of, of the day is clear about um, uh, its priorities, clear about why it's choosing to deliver them, uh, candid and takes people into its confidence about uh, uh, some of the challenges but also some of the uh, achievements. Um, but uh, there's a distinction that's drawn between um, the civil service implementing the government's policies of the day and explicitly political activity, um, and that distinction absolutely needs to be maintained. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, you said in your recent Ditchley lecture that you suggested that the civil service should be subject to significant reform. Um, so far, we've seen permanent secretaries replaced. Mm. Um, can we expect to see a programme setting out for an agenda for civil service reform at any point? Yes, I hope so. Um, um, our intention um, is that... Um, uh, and, and, and one thing, I, 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 I know that... Um, uh, it, it would seem unfair to pick you up on, 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 on this one verb. When you uh, talked about imposition, the one thing I would say, and, and you know, different people would draw their own conclusions, is that um, uh, civil service reform and change is something that we'll be doing with the civil service, not to the civil service. Um, and that is why I'm working with colleagues in the Cabinet Office to draw up um, a, an outline paper which will put flesh on the, uh, the thin bones um, of what I said at Ditchley and, of course, what the Permanent Secretary uh, Alex Chisholm has said at uh, Civil Service Live and elsewhere, but the, the short answer is yes. So the, the Prime Minister's Chief Advisor has suggested that civil, civil service should be subject to hard rain. So if you're working with them, they're not going to be they're not going to be subject to hard rain. No, um, I um, those words were attributed to the Prime Minister's Chief Advisor at a particular meeting. I wasn't in the meeting. I have colleagues who were. They don't recall him, uh, and there were three of them. They don't recall him having said that. So, you know, uh, my understanding of the reporting uh, is that this was one rare occasion where um, there was a mishearing, but that's what I was told. Um, uh, uh, I've never heard him use that phrase. And in terms of the, um, the makeup of the civil service, mm. in, in, the, um, in the lecture, I think you said mm. you wanted the civil service to be less southern, less middle class, mm. less anywhere, more somewhere. Yes. How do we achieve that without sort of, I mean, does that require greater political intervention in the recruitment and management of the civil service? How do we achieve that aim? I don't think political, but I think ministerial and civil service leadership. You know, one of the things that um, uh, the Permanent Secretary at the Cabinet Office, um, Alex Chisholm and I, um, are highly motivated to achieve is a greater dispersal of jobs across the United Kingdom through a programme called Places for Growth. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that the coronavirus pandemic has reinforced is that we don't need to have every civil servant based, not that they are, but you know what I mean, in Whitehall. Um, and so uh, I think that greater dispersal of roles is a, is a good thing in terms of broadening the talent pool um, and also a good thing in terms of helping to support economic growth and recovery across the United Kingdom. Um, and I think you know, there's a broader question. We always need to look at any organisation always has a tendency to recruit in its own image. And the one of the things I just wanted to do was to make sure that we were as diverse as possible. When I was interviewed by Gloria de Piero, the former Labour MP on uh, uh, Times Radio the other week, she pointed out to me the relative lack of people um, in the senior civil service uh, who'd come from particularly challenging uh, schools and socioeconomic backgrounds. And I think we've got to do better um, in that regard. Final thing I would say just at this stage is that everything that I said in the Ditchley Lecture was my view but I shared it beforehand with a variety of civil servants, including permanent secretaries. Uh, they made improvements to it. Um, I'm not saying that everyone agreed with everything that I said, but the, the, the whole point of it was that it was designed to be a collaborative exercise, and it was designed for that reason because um, I've had the benefit of working with great civil servants um, throughout my career, and, and, and I wanted to reflect that in, in, in what I was saying. So the, the forecast then is for balmy sunshine rather than hard rain. Well, uh, I think that... All of us in government uh, face some challenging times ahead, but the key thing is that we can only meet those challenges if we um, uh, ensure that the civil service, um, uh, as it, in my view always has done, uh, is true to the virtues of uh, integrity, impartiality, objectivity, candour, um, 
that has always marked it out. Um, and you know, there will be challenges ahead, but as we navigate those challenges, um, uh, what um, I know the civil service will do is to provide data-rich, well-evidenced um, uh, judgments about what ministers should or should not do, and then ministers will decide. And is there anything perhaps comparable for ministers? Because in, in fairness to you, in your dictionary lecture, you, mm. you know, ministers, as we know, are not infallible. You. So is there a, a, a data-rich matrix that you can judge the well, quality and usefulness of ministers as well of their civil servants? I think I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the evidence that, that civil servants will provide, but I think it's a very fair challenge. Um, and one of the questions in my mind is, you know, politics has an inherent volatility, mm -hmm. but what can we do to better prepare uh, people who might become ministers for that responsibility, and what can we better do to support ministers in the exercise of their responsibility? I mean, ultimately, politics is about judgment um, uh, uh, and uh, fulfilling a democratic mandate, um, and uh, no training, uh, no matrix, uh, can never substitute for judgment and accountability, but um, we can all do our jobs better and uh, sharing experience, certainly from those who've done it before, can help. Uh, I probably won't surprise you to know, even though I disagree with them on lots of things, I've benefited from hearing directly from Michael Hesselstein and Peter Mandelson about how to do the job, um, and uh, whatever mistakes I've made, I've made fewer as a result of what they've told me. The same question can be asked as committee chairman as well, I assure you of that. But can I go to a supplementary from uh, David Mundell, please? Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Grove, uh, one thing that, that uh, concerned me, including in, during my, my time in office, was uh, the, the very small number of civil servants in the higher echelons of Whitehall who'd had experience of working within the devolved uh, administrations. Mm. And likewise, now within the devolved administrations, I'm, I'm not mm. as familiar with Wales and Northern Ireland, but certainly the Scottish Government, of uh, individuals there who've worked within mm. uh, Whitehall. And is, is there any uh, mechanisms or uh, ideas in play to try and improve uh, that uh, exchange of individuals? Because as this committee has been told, you know, we still operate a one civil service uh, Absolutely. approach. You're right. It happens. It doesn't happen often enough. Um, uh, there are people who I work with at DEFRA who went on to work with uh, the Welsh Government um, and um, uh, you know, uh, very, very good civil servants. Um, I would ideally uh, like to see more of it happen, um, and that's one of the things that both I and Alex Chisholm are keen to promote. Thank you. David Jones, please. Yes, um, at Ditchery, uh, you also said that the civil service should better reflect the 52%. Yes. Uh, who voted to leave the European Union. Um, it, it, does that tend to confirm the suspicion that there has been abroad among certain people who did vote to leave the European Union, that the civil service, or at least the senior echelons, are staffed by people who would rather we were remaining? No, it's a very good question. Um, and, let me give, um, and, and, and let me try to answer it uh, as fully as possible, as briefly as possible. The first thing is that I think that, that um, uh, many of us who uh, live and work and operate in SW1, this has changed over time as a result of the general election, but still, um, uh, uh, many of the people within this village have not exhibited an understanding, a deep understanding, um, as you have, David, of the reasons why people voted to leave. And I think it's deepening that understanding uh, that is important, and it's an understanding of um, what... Um, our ultimate masters, the British public, uh, feel and think and want from government. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, I don't know how, with one or two exceptions, very rare exceptions, uh, any civil servant with whom I work has voted. But what I do know is that um, every civil servant with whom I've worked, um, uh, particularly on Brexit, and I've been involved both at DEFRA um, and uh, in the Cabinet Office on implementation of, of, of policies for the end of the transition period, uh, everyone with whom I've worked has worked very energetically to advance the government's uh, agenda. So uh, it may well be that there were some civil servants who uh, voted to remain and, and regretted the judgment, um, uh, but uh, I couldn't tell you who they were. What I can tell you is everyone with whom I've worked has done everything they can to advance uh, uh, the agenda of the elected government of the day um, as put forward by ministers. 
So, so could you prescribe? Could you describe precisely what you think is lacking there that needs to uh -huh. reflect I think, that fifty-two percent? Um, I think there's a broad, there, there is a broader <coughs> question, and it's less about uh, any department, any group of individuals. It's just a broader question as well. You sometimes find uh, that uh, people ascribe to those who voted to leave a set of motives, um, uh, which, in my view, doesn't uh, uh, do justice to the range of uh, factors uh, that lay behind that. And the Prime Minister, in uh, the levelling up agenda that he has outlined, I think gets to the heart of it. Um, and I think that one of the things that we need to recognise is that, over time, there were more people um, across the United Kingdom uh, who felt that uh, uh, the political classes um, uh, weren't responsive, weren't listening, didn't understand their concerns. Um, I don't think it's a purely leave remain thing, um, but I think that the, the referendum uh, uh, was uh, probably the, the biggest moment that uh, revealed or laid bare some of those concerns. Uh, and again, you know, one of the things I would stress is that, um, and, and it falls on partly from what Lloyd said earlier, um, North Wales, um, a, a, <clears throat> you know, is a part of the UK which perhaps insufficient people who live and work in London know, understand, and have had the chance both to visit and to work in. You will appreciate um, that there are uh, political currents, economic feelings, and so on that your constituents have that are sometimes poorly reflected, say, in what the BBC might broadcast at certain moments. So. I'm trying not to be critical of anyone. What I'm trying to do is to say we need to promote that understanding. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure you know uh, and could list some of the ways in which occasionally, even with the best will in the world, well-intentioned and generous-hearted people sometimes subscribe to a caricature of uh, some of our other citizens. And I think it's, it's trying to move beyond that, which is important. So this does not imply the end to the Northcote Rebellion um, principle of political impartiality? Absolutely not. I think there is a key distinction to be drawn. Civil servants must be impartial and objective. <coughs> that doesn't mean they're neutral, because civil servants, as I mentioned, are there to implement the policies of the government of the day. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, partly in response to Tom's question, we can always look about broadening the, the, the talent pool. But I think the other thing is that it's no diminution of objectivity to seek to extend people's sympathy and understanding of um, uh, all the citizens in this country. And then the, the, the one other thing about Northcote Trevelyan is you also do need political appointees in government, and you draw an appropriate distinction. I think special advisers play an absolutely critical role, and the reason why you need special advisers is that they, they should be doing things and providing certain advice which um, uh, you would not want a civil servant to. There have, of course, been efforts previously for many years to promote diversity in the mm. civil service in terms of uh, ethnicity, gender, disability, and so on. Uh, does your um, speech, it, 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 should we read from it that in fact that has been a failure or it hasn't gone far enough or it's been wrongly targeted or, or, or what? It's absolutely critical, um, uh, but there is more to do. Um, so I think the civil service has improved, uh, as most major employers have improved, over the course of the last few years in drawing people from diverse ethnic backgrounds, um, um, in ensuring that there is uh, a better representation um, of uh, women and people living with disabilities um, across the board and in senior positions, but there is more to do. That is absolutely vital. There's something else as well, which is um, uh, I'd like to promote intellectual diversity, so people who see things from different points of view. And again, I'm not talking about left-right. I'm just talking about people who can look at problems in in different ways, um, and that's a really valuable part of any organisation. I wonder if we could talk about churn in the civil service, mm. which has been identified as a problem for many years, in fact, not least by predecessors of this committee. Yeah. Um, how do you propose to tackle churn, and why do you think that it's remained a problem despite having been identified as one for so long? Um, I think it's, it's partly the, the, the way in which the uh, career structure of the civil service is oriented. Um, there are tools in the toolbox for permanent secretaries and others to encourage people to stay in particular posts. Um, something called the Pivotal Roles Allowance um, enables a great reward to be given and uh, other appropriate bonuses. Um, but there's often an incentive, uh, if you look at the, at the past,
for people to uh, uh, have to move department and have to move responsibility in order to secure promotion. Um, and the, uh, I think it's become more acute recently, and the permanent secretary at the Cabinet Office and I are looking at different ways in which we can change that in order to allow government departments to be more flexible so that people can rise within their profession, get that reward both in terms of status, uh, income and other areas uh, without them having to uh, leave the department and move into another area. I mean, it's clearly it's a significant problem, and yes. it seems to have de de defeated many predecessors of yours. So yes. How, how hopeful are you that you'll be able to resolve the issue? Hopeful, but there will always be some failures along the way. So I'm sure, not failures, uh, imperfections. So I hope we can improve the situation, um, but I don't think that, uh, I, I think there'll still be some moments when uh, ministers or permanent secretaries will regret the fact that someone whom they very much want to hold on to will be lost to them, um, but hopefully the situation will be better. How concerned are you about the current level of churn among uh, permanent secretaries in various departments? Well, uh, I've enjoyed working with some of those who've uh, left the government over the course of the last 12 months, um, and I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to those people with whom I work particularly closely, Richard Heaton as permanent secretary of MAJ, I really enjoyed working with. Uh, uh, Claire Moriarty, I worked with at DEFRA. She departed, as it happens, because the department for which she was responsible, DEXU, um, um, in which you served the distinction as a minister, David, uh, had reached the end of its natural existence. Um, but historically, um, it, it is the case that in other years, there's been a bigger churn at the top. So, uh, for example, in 2005, 12 permanent secretaries moved on. In 2007, 11, um, uh, and that's more than have done so uh, this year. So, um, I think it's important to look at it in, 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 in historical context. Can I just interrupt there? Because I think when... David Jones talks of churn. It was about people moving between departments. I think yes. it's a bit of a confusion to pretend. My apologies. Not at all. But can I just bring, and interrupting David as I am, bring Karen Smith in with a supplementary question at this juncture? Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. I, I mean, it, it, I, I would support what, what um, you, you said, Mr. Gove, about diversity and, and, and breadth, both intellectually, um, with more women, um, black minority, ethnic minorities, etc. But uh, for the civil service, but it, do you think it's incumbent on politicians and the government to ensure that that is reflected in special advisers as well? So what is the government's view of diversity and recruitment and retention amongst special advisers? Uh, my view is that it should apply across the board. Um, um, uh, in an ideal world, um, parliamentary parties should be more diverse as well. I, I think some of us are doing better than others on, on that, but is the government taking active steps with ministers to encourage greater diversity with special advisers? Yes. And how is that going? Um, I think that it, uh, if you look overall, you'll see that we have a uh, range of individuals from a variety of different backgrounds, um, and there are, there are some minority characteristics that are uh, better represented than others, but we, we continue to strive for diversity overall. And the majority, majority population, 51% women, how is that going? Um, I'd, I'd be able to tell you, I don't have the full list of special advisors in front of me, uh, so exactly what the proportion the is. You can but write to the committee afterwards. Well. I certainly will. Um, and I think there may be some special advisors who um, may uh, be covered by the protected characteristics of the Equalities Act who may not wish to necessarily reveal aspects of it, but we'll do our very best to provide you with that matrix. Respect their, respect their. Just very quickly as we draw to a close, could I ask how many of the Cabinet Office's civil servants have returned to work at least part-time from the office since the government encouraged other businesses to adopt that approach? Um, I'll have those figures tomorrow and I'll give them to uh, the committee as soon as we have them. Um, it varies depending on um, uh, site by site, but I will give you those figures. Could I just ask what the government has learned from the pandemic and, and home working and how that might affect an estate strategy going forward? Uh, it, a lot. And one of the things that um, uh, my colleague Lord Agnew is seeking to do is to make sure that um, we reduce our footprint in London overall um, and that where home working is appropriate, we facilitate that, but also where uh, we can have uh, uh, responsibilities uh, and indeed potentially whole departments operating outside London, that we do that as well. Okay, well, that was an hour's session. It was a canter through that, and we're looking forward to seeing you again in a few weeks' time, which we can explore those issues in greater depth. Can I just thank, thank uh, the, the committee members for their attendance this afternoon and for you, Michael? Uh, order, order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. sound. <laughs> Committee room six, sound.
Committee Room 6, Sound. Committee Room 6, Sound.